Hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Welcome to the webinar on the Workstream Elections. Uh, my name is Dries Aken. I'm the Deputy CEO of Solar Power Europe. Um, and I will guide you through this webinar. I must admit, this is one of my favorite meetings. Uh, that's a little confession uh, that I have to make at the beginning of this meeting, because this is about electing the new chairs and vice chairs of the Solar Power Europe work streams. And those work streams are very important to us. They're very important to the functioning uh, of Solar Power Europe. They're very central in the way we develop our positions. And interestingly, and I say that with a little bit of pride as well, what we develop in the work streams, the positions, tend also to make it into European legislation. So that is the uh, how important it is for us. Just to give you some examples, the rooftop solar mandate, that was us. The flexibility provisions in the electricity market reform originated from our side. Putting polysilicon in the critical raw materials that came from our leadership and from the leadership of the chairs and the vice chairs of the work streams. And that was just a couple of examples. So we are very excited to having this um, uh, webinar today. And um, let's maybe have a look at the agenda. We have 60 minutes together, which is not that much. I will introduce you, first of all, to the Solar Power Europe governance, the work streams, and the election process. And then we will take you on a journey through the work streams and have little presentations on that. Expect a journey that is quite dense. Um, with short three minute presentations on each of the work streams. So it will be relatively fast paced. Uh, I hope you had your coffee and are ready for that uh, hour together. And then there will be a Q&A and next steps. About the Q&A, just to make you aware that you can use the Q&A function on Zoom, which is at the bottom as is indicated by the arrow. Please don't be shy and put your question there. If we don't have the time to pick up your question during this webinar, you can be assured we will get back to that afterwards. So please don't hold back. Very good. So let me first of all say something about Solar Power Europe's governance and why the work streams are so important to us. We have a board, a board of directors that is confirmed and elected every year at the General Assembly in March or April. The board decides on overall strategic priorities and approves the positions of Solar Power Europe. But the positions itself are made in the work streams. So please follow the arrow down. And you can see that the positions are developed in the work streams. That's the beating heart of Solar Power Europe. Yeah. This is where the content is discussed. This is where the positioning is agreed, and this is where the magic happens. It's also where you can oversee related projects to the work stream. We also have other governance elements. We have a national associations committee, which is very important to us because that's a place where we exchange intelligence on national developments with the national associations members that we have. Um, and we have an advocacy committee, uh, which is open to sponsor and premium members where we exchange intelligence on the European Brussels uh, developments. The advocacy committee too uh, is looking uh, for a new chair and vice chair. So they're also part uh, of the elections together with the work streams. Which work streams do we have? We have 11 work streams. We have a couple of them related to upstream solar. So everything to do with supply chain sustainability, product sustainability, Manufacturing, those are three work streams. Then we have a cluster of work streams which relate more to deployments, for example, on land use and permitting, markets and investments, building and consumers, grids and flexibility, renewable hydrogen and electrification, and digitalization. And then we have work streams on life cycle quality and global markets, so 11 in total. Each of these work streams has one chair and two vice chairs. And their role is important. They steer the working program of the work stream, of course, together with the Solar Power Europe Secretariat and with the members of the work stream. 
and they represent the association at events. So the visibility is also an important part of the role of um, chairs and vice chairs of work streams. Let me give you a little bit of data on the election rules. So the chair and the vice chair positions are now open to premium and sponsor members. The number of positions held by the same organization, by the same member, is limited to a maximum of either one chair and one vice chair or two vice chairs. And the mandate for the chairs and the vice chairs is two years after the elections. The voting happens in the work streams and they're weighted following membership category. So there's one vote per company, but they're weighted according to um, yeah, the category of membership that you are in. How can you apply for your chair or vice chair position? It's already open. You can already express your interest to my colleague, Victoria Angelova. Um, there is a deadline, of course, so it's open as of now, but there's a deadline on the 8th of November. That's the formal deadline to send your candidacy and your application. You will see that for the digitalization work stream, it's slightly different. There, the deadline is already on the 4th of December, uh, November, sorry, just so you know that's him. Then after the 8th of November, there's um, the actual elections in each of the work streams between the 13th of November and the 1st of December. And then on the 4th of December, we will be announcing the results. Here you have the election dates. So for each of the work streams and the advocacy committee, there is a date in the agenda when the election takes place. So these are all between the 13th of November and the 1st of December, as I mentioned, with the exception of the digitalization work stream, which is on the 7th of November. So that's a little earlier, um, but I'm sure we can handle that soon. And as a last slide for the introduction, this is an overview of the current chairs and vice chairs. Um, you can see RWE, Ian, Greenvolts, EDP, Lightsource BP, NL, Amarenko, Wacker, Aquila Capital, Trina, Solar, Huawei, Volatalia, all of them are chairs of the work streams. And then you have also the, the vice chairs. All of these um, chairs and vice chair positions are now up for election in the time period that I mentioned with a two year mandate going forward. Very good. So let's kick off the journey I was talking about, the journey through the work streams. And we start with the advocacy committee, uh, which I will take on myself, uh, because the advocacy committee is run primarily by myself and my colleague Naomi Xavier. Um, the advocacy committee is about monitoring EU policy developments and advising Solar Power Europe's advocacy strategy, and is open to premium and sponsor members. So how does it work? It's about exchanging intelligence on European Brussels developments. It's about advising on advocacy strategy and tactics. So very concretely, we would be screening some of the position papers that come from the work streams and see how we position around it. Yeah? Uh, it's not about approving these positions. The positions are approved in the boards and developed in the work streams. But the advocacy committee is a place where we discuss the strategic and tactical approach um, uh, to uh, the, the Brussels um, target audiences. So it's about supporting Solar Power Europe's political positioning, our lines to take on key political developments. Uh, it's also a place where we organize meetings with important policymakers or third party influencers. And we have monthly meetings uh, that are mostly hybrids, so online or physical, but we also do quarterly physical meetings in Brussels. What did we achieve or what did we do in the last year? To give you an example, for example, we have the IA's top chief economist uh, coming uh, to Solar Power Europe office to talk to us. We have, for example, the upcoming presidency uh, coming to office to present the work program. Uh, or we have the commission to talk about important uh, key political developments. Going forward, what will be important? The advocacy committee will be quite critically important because we have a new EU leadership. So our positioning towards the new European agenda, towards the new European priorities, and uh, will be uh, quite essential. And the advocacy committee is, is central to that function. So that's the advocacy committee. I'm now um, passing on the word to my colleague, Emma, on the first work stream. Emma. 
Thank you, Dries, and good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Emma Dominici, the coordinator of the Supply Chain Sustainability Workstream, which brings together experts from the whole industry to define common approach to sustainability and supply chain transparency. And this uh, is in close collaboration with the Solar Stewardship Initiative, which is um, a solar specific supply chain assurance program. Uh, in the workstream, we uh, mainly focus on um, legislation related to due diligence, such as the forced labor ban and the corporate sustainability due diligence directive. Um, what did we achieve in the past uh, in the past years? Um, we uh, we developed many um, statements uh, and position papers on the forced labor ban uh, since the beginning of the. Uh, of the process, so when the Commission present the, presented the forced labour ban for the first time, and also we did the same for the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, we, um, we have been able to um, have the recognition of the multi-stakeholder initiative in the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, and we also uh, provided input uh, to the input paper to the Implementing Act of the Net Zero Industry Act on the responsible business conduct, so dealing with uh, uh, due diligence and social um, social responsibility. And uh, as I mentioned, we are closely collaborating with the Solar Stewardship Initiative, which is a product of the, so of the Supply Chain Sustainability Workstream, and that now it's a standalone um, initiative. What's coming next? Uh, we are. Um, we will be working on the input paper on forced labor ban implementing guidelines, where we will have also the commission speaking at our at our meetings in order to better prepare um, and provide input to the to the commission. We will work on the input paper on corporate sustainability due diligence directive implementing guidelines. But in the meantime, we are not only uh, closely following the legislation. We also um, provide uh, knowledge and share knowledge related to traceability of the solar supply chain. And as I said, all this is made in collaboration with the Solar Stewardship um, Initiative and its principles. So I'm looking forward to see you at the Supply Chain Sustainability Workstream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, let's move over to the next workstream. That's uh, Product Sustainability with Raffaele. Yes, hello. Thanks, Dries. Uh, good morning on my side. Um, I'm Raffaele, and uh, together with my colleague Daniela Blagheva, we coordinate the product sustainability work stream. Uh, you, can, you can read what's, uh, what's the mission of the work stream to establish sound and future proof policy measures for PV sustainability and carry out effective communication activities. Just to highlight that uh, the angle of this work stream is uh, with a focus on environmental sustainability as opposed to the social and governance focus from uh, um, from the supply chain sustainability that Emma just presented, and with a focus also on products, uh, so just to differentiate from the land use and permitting world stream, which would be presented later. Um, so our activities uh, cover policy processes such as PV, co design, and energy label. We've been focusing on the, the Net Zero Industry Act uh, legislation when it comes to the environmental criteria. We also look at uh, topics including material legislation on for PV and PV end-of-life frameworks. Um, and we, we, with regards to communication activities, we, we do publish uh, reports, uh, communication fact sheets, uh, uh, briefings, uh, and, and other uh, similar uh, deliverables. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we achieved in the last uh, 12 months, uh, we've been monitoring the PV co-design and energy label policy process, which is critical for, for our sector. The process has been somewhat delayed, but we are um, working towards a speedy finalization of this file from the European Commission. We have been supporting the manufacturing work, notably on the Net Zero Industry Act uh, environmental criteria for Article 26, and we're currently working on Article 25 and my colleagues will talk about that in just a minute. Uh, on materials legislation, we'll be looking mainly at uh, the PFAS uh, restriction proposals and we publish position papers. Um, when it comes to end of life, we are working, uh, following the developments when it comes to the WE directive revision 
as you know, uh, solar PV falls under the waste electronic and ele electric equipment, uh, and a revision of such uh, legislation is upcoming. Um, and when it comes to communication, notably, uh, we have started a couple of years ago with uh, an event focusing solely on PV sustainability, that is Sustainable Solar Europe, and you can see uh, a photo of last year's participation of uh, Commissioner for Environment, uh, Virginia Sinkovichus. What's next in the pipeline for us? We are currently working towards the finalization of uh, a, so a report on sustainable solar, uh, encompassing all the different sustainability dimensions that's coming at the end of the year. Um, as I mentioned, we are following and steering the finalization of PV Eco Design Energy Label that should happen in 2025. Uh, the revision of the WE directive, which should come between next year and 2026, um, the organization of our yearly sustainability event, and finally, we are also involved in a number of EU-funded Horizon Euro projects uh, that focus on PV sustainability, and this includes, for example, compliance services, which is about equipping the industry uh, for the upcoming PV co-design uh, obligations, and the ever PV project that looks at uh, end of life solar. I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rafael. Great. Let's continue the journey and we go to manufacturing with Carmen. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Tris. Um, and welcome. My name is Carmen Correas. I'm policy advisor um, and I coordinate the manufacturing workstream. Um, so to the question, what does the manufacturing workstream do in general, I would say very widely, um, we build a resilience PV supply chain um, by also making sure that we um, we, we target the, the development targets that the Commission has set, um, but indeed by focusing and making sure that the supply chain is um, solid here in Europe. And then by that, we do it by monitoring and inputting the different critical EU legislative files, the Net Zero Industry Act, among others. We also um, are um, supporting the EU industrial pro uh, projects for them to access the different supporting mechanisms, like the Innovation Fund, among others. And then also, of course, we're in close cooperation with the ASIA, with the European Solar Industry Alliance, by being Sherpas of the Demand Side Policies Working Group and by being part of the steering committee. Well, so as you can see in the slide, um, some of the things that we have achieved so far, although there are many, um, we selected the top ones of this year, which are um, so far the recommendations for the Energy Auctions Article in Net Zero Industry Act, so Article 26. As my colleague Rafael said, we also uh, are about to publish our input to Article 25 of the Net Zero Industry Act, which is public procurement. Uh, earlier this year as well, we worked on the Inverters Explained Report, which is a whole report analyzing the supply chain for inverters, which is not exactly the same as for PV, um, and that was very valid for the institutions, not to forget such an important segment of the supply chain. We have also been working on the European Solar Manufacturing Facility, which is um, a support uh, mechanism, a financial support mechanism uh, that goes in line with the Innovation Fund, but would also be focusing to, to activate member states to support their innovative uh, PV supply chains. We were also part of the signature of the European Solar Charter together with many member states and with many industries. Um, and we were happy to, to, to cooperate, cooperate and coordinate on that signature. It will soon be the revision and we'll also be part of that. And then just as an example of the many um, position papers and, and joint statements that we have been developing, there's one that we uh, signed earlier this year with Wind Europe on the need to have a targeted supply chain um, and net zero industry act. But we also have many examples of cooperation with national associations, um, which work at the member state level on how they can support their industries locally. So that's some uh, examples of what ha we have done so far. What's next? Indeed, uh, so we continue our work on the Net Zero Industry Act for public procurement, auctions, origin of components, among others. On uh, state aid, so uh, temporary crisis and transition framework um, mechanisms, we're asking for more OPEC support that is now lacking, uh, relaxation of the geographical conditions that we see. It's one of the main burdens uh, at the moment in the, in the member state level. And then also we're asking for an extension of the TCTF beyond 2025. As, an, as another example, um, we will continue our exercises on the solar manufacturing facilities to see how we can improve the, improve the current innovation fund. And then um, further engagement with the European Investment Bank so we can also have a financial mechanism in that, in that way. 
just to complete the picture, uh, as I said before, we're also very active in the European Solar Industry Alliance. So we will uh, as well always um, get together the manufacturing work stream with the work in the Alliance. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you there in this uh, manufacturing work stream. Absolutely. Thank you, Carmen. Great. So let's, these were the upstream related work streams. Let's move more to the deployment side and we start with uh, land use and permitting and Lena. Yes, thanks, Dries, and good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Lena Dubin, and I work as a policy advisor for sustainability, and I'm coordinating the land use and permitting work stream. Uh, just to mention, it's one of the biggest work streams at Solar Power Europe. It comprises of around 350 members, uh, and we are, of course, happy uh, to get more members on the board and help us work towards a swift and efficient deployment of inclusive and integrated utility scale solar PV, which is also compatible with the ecosystem restoration, nature conservation, and agriculture, which is the main and core objective of this work stream. Um, so what, how have we achieved in the past? So we worked a lot on different project and policy-based guidance documents. Um, so we have developed and published our AgriSolar Best Practice Guidelines, uh, second edition. We also worked on our floating PV uh, best practice guidelines, which is first of its kind that we have developed as part of the work stream activities. Um, we also have worked a lot on advocacy work. So we've also provided the European Commission with a recommendation and input on innovative forms of solar that also included floating PV and agri-solar policy recommendations. Aside from that, we also work a lot on the permitting side of uh, the solar and uh, specifically work a lot on the uh, renewable energy directive and, and the specific uh, rules that have been set out for the member states. Um, so we have developed a renewable mapping guidance that is aimed towards uh, the solar industry, but also relevant authorities that work with the spatial planning. Um, and last but not least, we have also developed our REST booster, which is uh, looking at the or stock taking on how the different member states uh, have integrated the permitting rules on a national level. So that is something, uh, some of the key objectives, key work that we have worked and developed so far. But there's also a lot in the future to look forward to. So what's next? Uh, first and foremost, we're going to continue uh, monitoring and influencing the implementation of the EU permitting rules as set out in the Renewable Energy Directive, and specifically looking at the renewable acceleration areas and working hand in hand with the Commission, with the Member States, and with the International uh, Energy Agency. We're also going to further work on supporting permitting through specific online dedicated tools. Some of those include, for instance, MOOC. Uh, which is aimed to inform and build capacity building for the local authorities uh, granting the permit process for solar. We're also going to be working on ensuring the implementation of a robust environmental biodiversity framework, so specifically looking at the implementation stage of the nature restoration law on national level, uh, as well as the similar permitting rules on the environmental impact assessment processes. And last but not least, also supporting the creation of biodiversity net gains, uh, which we are working together with the Nature Conservancy and going to be launching already next week. Uh, further in the pipeline, we're also going to be working, uh, providing guidance on community engagement uh, and on the different measures and revenue sharing mechanisms for, for engaging the communities. And last but not least, we're going to also further strengthen our work on dual use of land solutions. Uh, so we're going to develop an enabling framework for agri-solar that supports the revision of the next common agricultural policy, but also looking at how agri-solar can be recognized and uh, be part of the next uh, common agricultural policy rules and strengthening further our cooperation with the agricultural industries on a European level. And last but not least, we are also going to further do our work on supporting and enabling framework for floating solar PV through our dissemination activities, uh, such as policy paper uh, on a EU and a national level. Voila. So this is a little bit of what we have, we have worked so far, what's in the pipeline. Um, and that is it from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Lina. That was very clear. It's a big sandwich, as we say. Um, over to Simon for the markets and investment workstream. 
Thank you very much, Luis, and uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Simon Dupont. I'm a policy analyst in electricity markets and investments, and I'm also the happy coordinator of this markets and investments work stream. So what's our objective uh, in the markets investments work stream is to ensure that uh, solar PV investment flows so that we can reach this terawatt era. Um, and to do that, we obviously need a supportive uh, regulatory framework and regulatory environment for all routes to market, uh, including public investment. So, for example, contracts for difference and uh, set a framework, and for also private investments um, like power purchase agreements. So, what did you achieve um, in the past year? Quite some uh, great deliverables. So, first, with the recommendations on the design of renewable auctions. So this was in January 2024 and was directly inputting the European Commission on the, the design of renewable auctions and the guidance they published this year. Um, we also published a guidance on the design of contracts for difference. So to advise on the implementation of the market design and the new types of CFDs that are going to flow now into a national market. Uh, and uh, another interesting report uh, was the, the guidance on the implementation of the electricity market design, this new market reform um, that we, we collaborated uh, on this paper together with uh, the grid flexibility work stream and the digitalization work stream that my colleagues will present to you um, in a few moments. So apart from this credit reports, of course, that's, all, that's not all. So we also, for example, just to give you a few examples, worked um, recently on more market-related topics, for example, providing inputs to formal forward market consultations or to the bidding zone review. Um, and we also collaborate very closely with the resource platform that you may know uh, on the topic of power purchase agreements. So, so what's next uh, for us? Um, and to continue making sure investments keep flowing into solar projects. So we will monitor the, the good implementation of the electricity market design um, and also inputs the revision of the stated guidelines that is planned for the next months. Uh, this includes that making sure that uh, the, the design of new contracts for difference uh, supports the solar industry um, and that we can remove all barriers to purchase agreements. Another key priority for us, um, maybe most on, on the short term, is the development of this clinic deal um, because we would like to work on developing a renewable response to energy intensive. Uh, concerning the, the issue of uh, prices of electricity uh, that is uh, at the top of the agenda right now in, the, in Europe. So on that topic, we will collaborate very closely to the Renewable Hydrogen Education Roster. We will also assess the different proposals that are today on the table to develop locational investment signals. So I already mentioned the buildings on review, but uh, also we are assessing the, the possibility of having, for example, criteria related to the location of assets in renewable auctions. And so we will develop an industry position on these topics. And finally, um, for, for the next month, we are working on the reports on solar and storage uh, areas, technical, with uh, my colleague Katarina from the Grid and Flexibility Rostream, and economics uh, on our sites on, in the markets investment portion. So the idea is to monitor also the development of all policies that will support uh, hybrid and blocked PV uh, and the association of uh, solar plants with storage, um, which is going to be a very important topic to develop flexibility or flexible electricity system uh, of the future. So, so yeah, uh, if you want to join these exciting, exciting conversations, uh, discussions, please uh, join the raw stream and. If you want to be part of our secretariat, uh, please do candidate. Thank you. Absolutely. And good that you mentioned some collaboration as well, because this is really about the collective flexibilization of the energy system, uh, which is uh, yeah, a cross-cutting priority for the organization. Indeed, and on that very topic, uh, I'm happy to move, move over to the colleague Jan uh, on buildings and consumers, and he will be talking about synergies as well, flexibility, Jan. 
Thanks a lot, Dries. Uh, indeed, um, the Buildings and Prosumers Workstream has the objective of boosting PV on buildings um, and the local system integration of rooftop solar. So we work both on uh, C&I uh, installation, but also on residential solar, increasingly also on balcony solar. We also work on uh, BIPV, um, as well as heat pump and electric vehicle integration into rooftop solar. And we have been finishing the work on energy sharing, meaning the local system integration of, of buildings. Um, we, the goals of this buildings and prosumers work stream are first of all, to get a strong implementation of the EU solar standard, which is the requirement to install uh, solar on all, on all buildings or a majority of buildings in the European Union. We want to ensure that we have a strong business case for rooftop solar, building strongly on self-consumed electricity, so we're staying within the building, but also integrating smart and flexible buildings into the markets and electricity grids. Also by integrating increasingly heat pumps and electric vehicles. Um, what, what we have achieved in the past is, uh, is, is quite significant. So we've managed with the report that we wrote on energy sharing to get energy sharing into the EU electricity market design, rolling out energy sharing from currently five member states uh, or round about five member states to uh, all 27 member states uh, over the coming years. We have significantly uh, expanded the EU solar standard, the requirement to install solar on EU buildings, um, for making it require a requirement to install solar on public buildings, but also on, on a, a large number of renovated C&I buildings. We've developed a mapping of compensation schemes for rooftop PV, putting us in a good position to uh, give input on feed-in tariffs or net metering schemes or their phase-out um, and how to uh, align compensation schemes with uh, grid-friendly behavior of flexible buildings. And we organize yearly strategy days where our members meet in Brussels to, uh, to discuss the strategic priorities, to, to exchange on, on market trends and which business models work and which ones are, are challenging at the moment. For the next steps, this is of course going to be defined by you. So the new chairs and vice chairs of this work stream. Um, we are looking forward to, to hearing your contributions on the agenda. We have of course gathered some ideas. So first of all, uh, we will develop an implementation guideline for EU member states, uh, guiding them how to implement the EU solar standard, putting the vague uh, or a little bit uh, broader requirements from the EU legislation into concrete requirements that can be implemented by member states. This will be the first uh, big deliverable that we are already starting to work on. Um, we are going to contribute to the affordable housing plan, which is currently under debate in the European, uh, in the in the, in the by the European Commission, and will be proposed uh, soon. So here we'll make sure that rooftop PV um, features in plans to make housing more affordable in Europe. Um, we will make sure that um, rooftop PV gets more grid friendly than it is today for uh, moving from an injection first scheme to a, to a flexible, flexible building scheme um, while ensuring a strong business case. Um, so, for example, um, via the electricity market design or the revision of the state aid guidelines. And lastly, we will uh, improve, uh, contribute to improving financing conditions uh, for, for rooftop PV, uh, for example, via the EU investors dialogues, which focuses on guarantee schemes, uh, reducing the investment costs, uh, such as interest rates uh, for investments into rooftop PV. So uh, to, to sum this up, um, our vision is really to ensure a strong business case um, by, by moving from the old old uh, injection first uh, framework towards a, uh, a more uh, flexible and a more market integrated uh, approach where uh, we actually have smart and flexible buildings. Thank you very much, Jan. Continuing on that grids and flexibility dimension, uh, over to Katarina. Thank you, Dries. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katarina Augusta. I'm the Senior Technical Advisor at Solar Power Europe, and I'm leading the grids and flexibility work stream. The goal of this work stream is to support the deployment of PV and flexibility solutions from utility scale until residential level, so complementing a bit uh, the other work streams. Um, on this work, we need uh, to be in close collaboration with the EU institutions, regulators at national level, but also the um, representatives at European level and with system operators from uh, the transmission side to the distribution side. So it's a lot of exciting discussions um, under this work stream. 
We also uh, work inside of the Energy Storage Coalition where we raise the awareness of uh, energy storage and uh, the barriers and uh, that still need to, to be taken in account. Uh, regarding what uh, we have been doing on the last two, ye uh, two years, we have been quite busy, as you see, um, GRIDS is on the focus of uh, Europea uh, Europe now, and that's very good because it means that we'll be able to integrate more solar um, into the grid. And for that, we have been working on several fronts. Uh, in 2022, uh, we support the clean energy package by setting uh, uh, recommendations from grid planning to grid connection. Uh, we also work on 2023 on storage needs, uh, so showing the potential of storage and the current barriers that um, need to be tackled. Um, we continue uh, exchanging with system operators and in uh, 2023 we work together with other associations and the DSOs where we set round tables where we could discuss how to better connect uh, solar PV to the grid, how to improve the connection rules uh, at distribution level, how to plan better grids in order to integrate all these uh, solar electrons into the grid and which kind of investments we need uh, into grids in order to, to be able to do this. And this year we focus a lot on flexibility because we believe that flexibility is part of um, this um, important role that grids will have. It will improve the way we use our electricity systems and will support integration of solar. So on that, we work on our Alexa market design guidance on several topics, and we will follow them uh, on their implementation. And we launch our mission Solar 2040, where together with our Let's Flex campaign, we will continue explaining the uh, potential of flexibility and also how we see um, this travel until 2040 and what we need to work uh, on flexibility for, for achievement um, that we need to, to target regarding uh, solar integration. So what's coming next? Uh, very uh, exciting six actions uh, from continuing monitoring and the lesson market design on grid related topics. So we'll uh, continue supporting flexible grid connection agreements, anticipatory investments, uh, grid capacity hosting maps in order to have more visibility on the grid and how we can better integrate our solar projects, um, flexible needs assessment, so how much flexibility we'll need to grow in each member state. Um, and then with this, we will also support shaping the EU agenda on grids, uh, particularly on the guidance on the SO planning that is coming from the Commission and also on discussions on budgets on uh, MEFF. But also important, as you saw, we need to have um, a battery storage agenda. So we will support also to shape this agenda at European level um, in putting on upcoming commission initiative on storage and turn the system flexibility into a political priority. Uh, through our Let's Flex campaign that I invite you to have a look on our website and through the Energy Storage Coalition that we'll also have an event next Monday. So join us and come uh, also discuss flexibility there. Uh, other three important um, actions are um, the preparation on the network codes. So we are focusing on two big network codes that we believe that are crucial for solar. And the first one is demand response. So it's a code on flexibility. We're part of the drafting committee and we'll continue working with ACER and the other stakeholders to, to continue um, uh, improving this network code until the entering force on 2026. And then regarding uh, connection to the grid, we are supporting also the network code on requirements for generators, particularly on, on hybrid solar systems, so clarifying the potential of these systems and the requirements um, uh, regarding these kind of systems and then also on the new grid forming requirements. So clarifying uh, the potential of um, solar regarding this and um, the requirements that um, inverters can um, answer to this necessity. And last one, but not uh, less important, we will be also supporting uh, the upcoming uh, ACER report on network tariffs for connection and for use of the grid. Uh, so we will analyzing barriers and potential of the different methodologies in order to support uh, solar integration and promote flexibility.
And um, this is all from my side. So I just welcome you to have a look on, uh, on this work stream and invite you to join if you are not yet part of these discussions. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Katarina. It's a very good uh, perspective also on the high level political narrative that we have to work on, as well as on a very technical level that we have to work on. And both are equally important. So thanks for that. Um, moving on, we go to digitalization. Uh, and that's back to my colleague, Jan. Thanks a lot, Dries. Um, the objective of the digitalization work stream is to uh, use data as much as possible to increase the efficiency of PV power plants, but also their flexibility, while at the same time making sure that um, it's cyber secure, that we that it's secure uh, and future proof. So concretely, this means we work on uh, data interoperability and data management for utility scale power plants over the life cycle of, of the PV system, making sure that the data is of a high quality and it's understandable for everyone um, so that um, all people across the, across the value, all stakeholders across the value chain can uh, use and leverage this data. Um, on cybersecurity, um, this means um, we take a look both at uh, large ground-mounted PV installations, but also the new small-scale PV installations, which more resemble IoT devices, uh, to um, ensure the cybersecurity for, for both these systems. And to a lesser degree, and in close collaboration with the flexibility work stream, um, we um, make sure that we get the data infrastructure both to communicate between devices but also with grid operators and flexibility service providers uh, to make sure that flexibility services um, run. Uh, the achievements um, over the past year, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it was revamped last year. Uh, the achievements over the last year was that we developed a, a cybersecurity position paper over six months, which is quite technical and provides solutions to all uh, issues that we see with a cybersecurity for PV power plants. Um, we develop uh, state-of-the-art solutions, which uh, are also applicable to uh, EVs, EVs, storage, and uh, energy management systems. Um, and we are in close contact with the European Commission on this. So we have uh, around monthly meetings with DGNR uh, to, um, to, to make sure that uh, we get the good framework that we have for utility scale installations, also for small scale uh, PV installations, um, which are often centrally centrally controlled uh, by uh, the aggregators or by the manufacturers who do updates on them. With this cybersecurity position, we also contributed to the Net Zero Industry Act. Um, as you know, the, the the file that aims to boost uh, EU manufacturing for 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 clean energy equipment. And we worked a lot on the implementing regulation for demand response, which um, focuses on data that is necessary to make demand response services possible. So what is next for the digitalization work stream? Again, this will be defined by the new chair and vice chair positions. Of course, we have our plans, um, our, our plans and ideas for the for the upcoming upcoming two year term, uh, starting with the digitalization uh, strategy day in Brussels on 14th of November, where we will gather uh, stakeholders across the value chain to discuss on um, on both the high level priorities, to discuss on data management, to discuss on how to best leverage AI for uh, for for, for power plant operation, um, but then also to discuss sector coupling. The next topic that we are already kicking off is data handling best practices uh, for utility scale installations. So how to make sure that the data that every stakeholder gathers throughout the entire uh, the entire life cycle of a project is really best used. Um, we're kicking this off this week um, and it will go until Q1 2025. We will continue to work closely with the European Commission on, on cybersecurity, um, making sure that the recommendations that we have in our position paper are actually implemented either in EU law or in the relevant uh, national legislation. So we're talking to uh, national regulators, but also partially to national ministries uh, on, on our recommendations. On other files, um, we are participating in, a net, in an expert group on the network code on cybersecurity, uh, which is led by NSOE and the EU DSO entity. We are participating in the EU's smart energy expert group, which is a commission task force uh, focusing on uh, data spaces, but also cybersecurity. Uh, we are closely monitoring all developments around AI, but mostly from an industry uh, knowledge exchange perspective to uh, to make sure that uh, we serve as a platform for you to exchange, uh, exchange ideas and best practices. And as I already mentioned, sector coupling. 
So um, it's uh, the dig digitalization work stream is really a forum for you to exchange, to exchange best practices um, and to make sure that we use data to the best possible extent in PV installations while ensuring it's cyber secure. Thank you very much, Jan. I think we're nicely on track. Uh, we have three more work streams to present and then we will have some time for the Q&A. Uh, so just maybe also as a reminder to everybody uh, of the existence of the Q&A function and uh, don't be shy. Um, thank you very much. So over to Anais on renewable hydrogen and electrification. Yes, thank you, Dries. Uh, my name is Anais Fauché. I'm a policy advisor at Solar Power Europe, and I'm coordinating the Renewable Hydrogen and Electrification Workstream. Um, so that workstream is focusing on supporting the deployment of electrification, but also renewable hydrogen in hardware bed sectors um, through market insight, policy advocacy, um, strategic coordination, uh, both with the members, but also with the institutions. Um, and it's also interesting to uh, mention that we work in close collaboration with two important entities, the Electrification Alliance and the Renewable Hydrogen Coalition. So in terms of um, activities and in terms of, of, of what we did this last, week, um, last year, um, mainly we worked a lot on um, making sure that we have clear rules for the certification of the RFNBO, so the renewable hydrogen, uh, but also define our position on low carbon hydrogen uh, with the upcoming Delegated Act. Um, and finally, we also managed to, uh, together with the Electrification um, Alliance, to have uh, an electrification action plan. And I think this is very important because um, our efforts um, were quite clear. We had a DA, um, a clear rules on our FNBOs, but also um, we have seen in the mission letters of uh, the Commissioner President that an electrification action plan will be proposed by the Commission. So this is, I think, a very important point for us. So what's next? I was mentioning the mission letters. We have seen that a lot of topics will be interesting for our work stream. And I think the work stream will be uh, key to, to, to work on the new mandate. So I was mentioning the electrification action plan, but also the clean industrial deal, because we, we're not only working on electrification of end uses, but also working on electrification of industrial processes if when possible. Um, also, um, and this has already been mentioned, but we'll work on the urban affordable housing plan. So that's on, on the key uh, upcoming new initiatives. Uh, in terms of ongoing work, we'll still work on ensuring clear certification rules for our members, um, make sure that uh, uh, it is make sure that we have le legal certainty for certifying renewable hydrogen, but also uh, providing a level playing field uh, with the low carbon hydrogen. Another big focus for us will be on the targets. First, the implementation of the Fit for 55 targets uh, for 2030, but also support uh, the work on the 2040 climate targets. And here again, ensure certainty on um, the mandates that we already have and how, how much um, they are taken into account by the member states at implementation level. Uh, finally, we'll work on financial support, both for electrification and renewable hydrogen. Um, of course, we'll uh, continue our work on the financing part um, of uh, hydrogen, for example, with the European Hydrogen Bank, but we will also uh, work and monitor um, the discussion around the budget and the competitiveness fund that will be presented as part of the multi-annual financial framework. So that's it for me. I think um, being part of this work stream will be really key uh, for the new mandate. So yeah, feel free to, to contact me if you would like to, to be part of it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Anais. Uh, electrification yeah, and hydrogen in the right places uh, is such an important uh, part of the energy transition. So thanks for laying that out. Very good. Okay, so we move forward to uh, another topic on life cycle quality, and that's my colleague, Nikki. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicoletta Fodor, and I'm a project officer within the research and innovation team at Solar Power Europe. Um, recently took over uh, the coordination of life cycle quality work stream. Um, with this work stream, our main aim is to raise um, service quality across all PV lifecycle phases. So from engineering, procurement, 
uh, construction through operation maintenance um, to um, end of life phase um, with the aim to increase trust and transparency across um, the entire value chain. And um, we try to do this by um, standardizing processes through resources, um, certifications and uh, courses, which I can present a bit more on um, when going to the slide on our achievements. Um, so one of the main outputs of the work stream um, are the so-called solar best practices guidelines. Um, these best practices guidelines uh, provide recommendations on several segments uh, in the life cycle. Um, and based on these solar best practices guidelines, the work stream has also worked on developing um, best practices checklists. These checklists um, serve as a way of uh, self-assessment for companies to, to make sure that they are uh, working according to um, the recommended um, best practices. And the latest achievement is the solar best uh, practices mark. Um, which um, can be obtained by our members free of charge um, after the uh, successful completion of, um, of the mentioned uh, checklists. Um, what's next? Um, so um, as mentioned, we are working on um, different type of checklists and by end of this year, uh, we aim to to disseminate a new one on engineering procurement and construction and beginning of next year to with this uh, checklist to launch the best practices mark for uh, EPC. Um, there on the solar best practices guidelines, there is continuous work on so each year. Um, they are being reviewed to make sure that um, they are very much up to date. So this is as well um, on the agenda for next year. And what is new is um, focusing a bit more on skills uh, through the Lifecycle Quality Academy that we plan to kick off um, this year um, to, um, based on the materials um, created uh, within the work stream, uh, we can provide resources, certifications and courses uh, to contribute to the standardization of knowledge and skills um, across uh, the whole life cycle. And um, what is also exciting is that annually we have the Solar Quality Summit uh, event, which is a close collaboration with this work stream, an event specially focusing on quality. Um, all the work uh, done uh, with this work stream will be very much present at this event. So very much looking forward to, to see you at the event and uh, hopefully um, at the work stream as well. Thank you, Nikki. And then last but not least, uh, we move to the global markets work stream, and it will be Benjamin presenting. Thanks so much, Dries, and hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Benjamin Clark, but you're very welcome to call me Benji if you'd like. Uh, and I'm the global markets manager for Solar Power Europe. And um, so, look, it's a it's a big and exciting world out there, and that means two main things. There's a lot of complexity, but there's also a lot of opportunity for solar. And at the Global Markets Workstream, what we're really trying to do is to help you realize business opportunities in your target markets. We do this kind of by advocating for better business conditions for solar in emerging and global markets, um, by working with the European Commission to improve and update EU financing tools available to you in, in emerging and global markets. Um, and also, we don't just do that. We try and support you in accessing these financing tools um, for, so that you can complete your projects. Um, and, and finally, we are present across a bunch of global fora and, and we use our position as a trusted partner with many different associations and organizations around the world to provide visibility for you, speaking opportunities and free tickets to these global fora such as Africa Energy Forum, World Future Energy Summit, and so on and so forth. Maybe we can go to the next slide. So this year, what have we done? Um, we've released two investment reports on, uh, on target markets for our members. Number one on Kazakhstan, where we've been focusing a lot on the update to the balancing regulation that's going on there and also one on Oman. We've engaged with the Ministry of Energy of both of the ministries of energy for both of these countries, but also the EU delegations there. Um, 
as you can see on the top right hand corner, uh, that's our director of global affairs, Mate Heiss, who is um, a representative in the Global Gateway Business Advisory Group, but also the Industry Advisory Board of the MedGem Network. These are both fora where, um, where we put forward your positions and look to steer key EU initiatives um, to benefit solar and to benefit you. We also recently launched the International Solar Manufacturing Initiative, or ISME, which is trying to help European equipment providers and European solar manufacturers to leverage global gateway funding and EU development cooperation financing to achieve projects overseas and generate business opportunities for them there. Um, and finally, as I was saying, we participate in a range of global fora. Um, the picture here is from Africa Energy Forum, which this year had over 25 African heads of state appearing. We managed to get our members speaking slots in the program and a good deal of visibility there. So what is coming up next? We have, at the end of this year, we will be launching an investment report on Morocco, which is a high profile, fast growth market at the moment uh, that a lot of European companies are interested in. We will be sending a delegation to Morocco uh, to meet with key stakeholders there, including Mazen and the EU delegation. Uh, we will be continuing our work with the International Solar Manufacturing Initiative, and we will also be hosting an investment forum at the start of November in Tunis, in Tunisia, a pan-African investment forum aimed at mobilizing investment for renewables in, in Africa. Um, we are also putting the finishing touches on our latest uh, input paper to the Commission. This time it is on export credit agency and development finance institution co enhanced coordination and how that can be better leveraged to support EU solar companies do business in uh, in emerging and global markets. Um, and we will, of course, be continuing our advocacy on your points via the MedGem Network Industry Advisory Board and the Global Gateway Business Advisory Group. I think that's probably enough from me now. So back over to you, Drews. Thank you. I never get enough of you, Benji. Uh, thanks for that clear outline. I'm aware of time. Uh, we have run uh, through all of the work streams. The journey has been completed. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the colleagues for uh, doing that uh, in a disciplined way. Um, I'm looking at uh, the Q&A now, and I saw that we got a couple of questions. Uh, one question was related to uh, the fact whether current chairs and vice chairs can re-candidate, uh, re-propose a candidacy. Uh, and the question and the answer to that is, yeah, yes, they can. Uh, so that's that's very clear. Uh, to, to answer that. Uh, I also saw two questions more on topical uh, issues with respect to land use and permitting and agri-PV uh, from, from Christine. I suggest that we uh, take these questions um, uh, offline uh, and that um, uh, I will put you in touch uh, with the, the responsible work stream leader, in this case, Lina, uh, to uh, give you the answers to that. Um, which leaves me with one question uh, from Juan Carlos uh, at Ibadrola, uh, asking about the voting procedure, um, why this is done in separate meetings per work stream, uh, as opposed to uh, one collective of voting moments. Um, uh, and that is, of course, something we thought about, Juan Carlos, but it's, 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 it's very hard to organize it. Uh, it would actually be um, not very practical. But maybe I ask my colleague, uh, Victoria, uh, who is uh, uh, leading um, the election process uh, to come in and give you a little bit more of an uh, explanation on that, uh, Victoria, if I may. Yes, thank you so much, Trace. I hope everyone hears me well. So yes, I would take just a moment to elaborate on this as I'm also conscious of the time. Um, so why it would be extremely difficult to have one voting election procedure? Well, the answer is actually quite straightforward. Since we're electing 33 representatives, that is 11 work streams with three positions, one chair and one vice chair position, plus we're also electing three leading positions for the advocacy committee, so in total 36 positions. Um, that would leave us in a meeting uh, that would last probably four and a half hours. Um, so it would be extremely difficult to arrange that happening in one single shot. Another point of view is that the elections of each work streams 
um, leading groups, so the chair and vice chair positions, are mostly focused on the participants of each work stream. So they're not so much relevant on a sole power Europe member wide level, such as, for example, um, the elections that we have at our annual general meetings where everybody is invited to vote for the board of directors but rather the participants of each work stream and they elect themselves who they want to lead the work on, uh, which they're very focused on. Now, another thing is that currently we have a pool of um, 45 uh, sponsor and premium members. So that leaves us with around 90 applicants. So again, um, if everybody gets three minutes to present, we would be well into the five hour meetings. And lastly, another thing that we should also mention, and it is very relevant for the voting procedure, so it's important to make clear, is that the voting is not live and immediate during the presentation meeting that you have seen the schedules for, but rather we leave this open for two business days so that we can give you an opportunity to think about who you want to elect as the leader of the work stream, as chair and vice chair positions. So we'll give you this time so that you can be able to elect this. So another reason why we won't be able to have one meeting that elects all the chairs and vice chairs, we give you just a little bit more time for you to be able to take care. And one other important part is that on the first round of the elections, we will be electing the chairs. So there, if there is a large pool of candidates, there will be another electronic voting form sent immediately after we elect the chairs with the vice chair's election. So it goes into two steps. Uh, but I hope that covers all the points within this question. And I hope that provides a little further clarity for everyone. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, Victoria. I saw also a new question coming in with respect to uh, the topic of uh, health and safety and um, uh, environment. Uh, that question, I would say, we certainly covered that, uh, health and safety issues uh, in the life cycle quality uh, work stream primarily, and or the product sustainability depends on exactly what you're looking for in terms of environmental impacts. But uh, yes, I mean, there's not work stream that is cold like that, but uh, it's obviously uh, of prime interest uh, in those two work streams. Very good. Um, this was the time that we had. This is what we had to say. Uh, I hope it was informative uh, to you. Uh, the slides will be shared together with the recording of this webinar uh, immediately following this webinar. And yeah, what rests me is to ask you to apply, uh, give it some thoughts, um, um, uh, be assured of the importance and the impacts and the visibility you will get as a chair or a vice chair. And uh, we look forward to continuing the process. Um, well, and with that, I wish you a wonderful rest of the day and thank you for making the time.